Good morning and welcome to today's local government education program. My name is Zach Kennedy, specialist in community and economic development for Illinois Extension. For production quality, we ask that participants keep microphones muted and videos off during the webinar. Any technical issues should be entered into the chat box. Recording of the webinar will be made available on our archives and all registered participants will receive materials and links to recordings in a follow-up email after today's presentation. Today's webinar is the second in a four-part series called Developing Broadband Leadership in Partnership with the Illinois Office of Broadband and the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. We are happy to welcome back Bill Coleman, who will introduce us uh, to the experts who will speak to you and the importance of developing a shared community broadband vision that engages community leaders, residents, and broadband provider partners. Um, our other speakers today are Joanne Hovis, CEO of CTC Technology and Energy, Michael Smeltzer, founder and board member of UC2B, Brian Olson, general manager of I3 Broadband, and Barry Adair, general manager of Wabash Communications. We also have a couple um, other guests that will be introduced um, as they are getting ready to speak. Before we begin, please know that you should add any questions to the chat space at any time, and I'll moderate those during the Q&A at the end of the final um, speaker's presentation. So Bill, thank you again for being here, and now I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the State of Illinois Office of Broadband webinar, Community Broadband Development Models. We have what I think will be a great panel of broadband experts to talk about the community role in advanced broadband network development. Thank you, Zachary, and thanks to Illinois Extension for helping to host this webinar series. The very title of this webinar might make some of you ask, what differentiates community broadband development from plain old broadband development? In my experience, broadband projects with strong community engagement cover larger geographic areas. They prioritize the notion that serving everyone is critically important, and they spur more sophisticated technology use by community anchor institutions like schools, healthcare, government, and business. That is great broadband. The road to great broadband does not have to mean government-owned broadband networks, but it can, and there are many, many examples of this model happening all across the country. In fact, there are several real benefits to government ownership, including the notion of multiple ISPs delivering competitive services over an open network, easily deployed existing advanced smart city applications for traffic, energy use, sewer and water system management, as well as new applications to come. There are also risks and restraints uh, that should make local officials consider and choose their path wisely. Communities can engage with existing providers to upgrade or expand broadband networks, or they can work with prospective providers who will build new networks and bring competition to an underserved or overpriced telecommunications market. Communities can edge into their broadband development strategies by focusing on community anchor institutions, downtown areas, or other business development areas, and then expand to community or countywide deployment in a phased approach. One thing is clear, communities with three wired providers benefit tremendously from enhanced competition, uh, no matter who owns the network. Does every community need to be engaged in the broadband issue? Some communities are blessed with one or more great broadband providers. This slide might help you decide on the urgency for your own community. Download speed, upload speed, ubiquity, affordability, reliability, mobility, and latency are all factors to consider. Different groups of customers would rate these factors very differently in importance. For many residents, affordability is a critical issue. For businesses, reliability and upload speeds might be the most important to their bottom line. An assessment of your community's uh, broadband services will help you to decide whether this is a critical need for your community and deserving of the required commitment of time, energy, and political capital. If your community's broadband service is mediocre, it is not likely to get much better anytime soon without active community engagement. 
If you are concerned about poor or totally absent broadband in the rural countryside, you need to be engaged to ensure that the coming funding from state and federal governments will support projects that support population and economic development growth into the future. So community engagement is very important for quality broadband development. Only communities should be the final arbiter of what is good enough when a community's economic future depends on advanced broadband services. There are clear steps to moving forward on your broadband journey. First comes some sort of community awakening to the importance of broadband by elected officials, staff, or, or citizens. Next, you need to get educated, gather data about existing services and community demand. Determining the range of acceptable community roles is critical. That can range from cheerleader to network owner, but these are leadership decisions. Talking with incumbent providers is critical to understanding their future plans and how your community fits into them. These ability studies provide more detail analysis and should create a decision-making funnel for community leaders rather than kind of a set document. Finally, selecting an implementation strategy, including technology, financing, and partnership choices. Those six balls turn into a more complex pathway chart. You will see a few directional arrows on this chart sending forward, people forwards and backwards. You need to expect some backward movement and maybe even a brick wall or two. In reality, the flowchart looks more like the shoots and ladders board game. For some of you parents, this board may look all too familiar, especially these days with homeschooling and uh, uh, staying safe. And for community leaders, your role is likely to be something like this. Juggling is all part of this and keeping many balls in the air. Picking up balls that you've dropped is really important. To learn more about this community broadband process, today we actually have five uh, uh, highly qualified presenters. Joanne Hovis, Michael Smeltzer, Brian Olson, Barry Adair, and Joey Myers. And I'll introduce each in turn as they come up to speak. First up is Joanne Holbus, president of CTC Technology and Energy. She's a nationally recognized authority on broadband markets and on the evolving role of public-private broadband partnerships. For more than 20 years, she has directed CTC's national consulting services related to broadband strategic planning, market analysis, business modeling, and financial analysis for several states and many cities. She is expert in federal programs such as E-Rate, uh, ReConnect, the Connect America Fund, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, and the Healthcare Connect Fund. Joanne is also CEO of the Coalition for Local Internet Choice, also known as CLIC, and is on the board of the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, Consumer Reports, and the Fiber Broadband Association. Welcome, Joanne. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you and, um, and with all of you. And I want to say a special thank you to University of Illinois Extension, the Illinois Office of Broadband, and of course, the Benton Institute, um, on whose board I have been privileged to serve for many years. Um, <clears throat> I look forward to um, starting or continuing this conversation from the really useful, um, I think, an insightful framework that Bill just gave us uh, about the role and the responsibility of a community in going through a planning process um, that is designed to situate that community in a place <coughs> where it can really have impact and meaningfully um, advance the ball with regard to the community's needs. And um, I, I want to suggest to you all, um, without going into um, enormous detail, but I'd like to kind of um, suggest I'm that. That. Um, hi, I did somebody just ask something? Okay. 
Bill, stop me if um, if you can't see my slides. Or no, go ahead, Joanne. I think that was just an inadvertent uh, interruption. Okay, no worries. Um, all good. Thank you. Um, so this graphic is a means of trying to simplify for those of you who are thinking about how do I build strategy for my community and how do I go through a, a really robust process of getting from where we are now, which is a strong knowledge of our problems and our frustrations and our requirements to a clear strategy for partnering, execution, um, and um, potentially at the end of the process, uh, participating in federal and state grant and auction opportunities. How do we get from here to there? And as I think Bill framed really beautifully, it's really critically important that you not start with the, there's a funding opportunity, I'm going to build my strategy around that funding opportunity. Particularly when we're talking about federal auctions that come with massive amounts of red tape, limited um, eligibility, and very challenging economics as a standalone opportunity. That kind of opportunity, whether it's a federal auction, a federal grant program, or a state grant program, should be part of a broader strategic approach that is the end result of a multi stakeholder engagement effort that includes your community, your internal community partners, including the community nonprofits and foundations that um, have a stake in your community, and really critically, the private sector. For many of the communities around the country who are making significant progress in this process, they're doing it in various forms of public-private partnership. And I use that term very broadly. A public-private partnership might mean a private sector contractor who um, executes for you, but it also might mean a private partner who leases assets to you or leases assets from you, a private partner who takes on risk um, that is shared with you, a private partner who maybe takes on all of the risk from you in return for a variety um, or a range of types of support that you might offer, including supporting them with an auction or a grant funding strategy, or as a community, making a grant yourselves to that private partner in return for certain kinds of commitments around build out and service. But to get to that kind of decision making and to, to get to that model that is actually actionable, you should ideally, and this is a just a kind of a general set of guidelines, you should go through a process that is rigorous, um, multi-stakeholder, broad-based, um, and driven toward having a strategy and an action plan that is a clear business plan, not only a vision from a policy standpoint, but something that is financially viable and actionable as a business matter. So what does all that mean in practice as you go through this? I, um, I, won't, I don't wanna to read to you what's already on a slide, but I'll, I'll say this. Think of the pieces of this graphic that are blue as being the outreach and engagement and stakeholder um, uh, uh, interaction parts of your planning process. You start as a community with all of your partners and stakeholders that you already know of, determining your requirements and your goals, in part by understanding what the challenges are and prioritizing where you'd like to go. And then as you move through the process from that inner stakeholder effort, you now move into the technical portions, which are in green on this graphic. So understanding where are you seeking to serve? How do you prioritize those areas? What is served and what is not served currently? Um, and this is a mapping and um, technical uh, process for understanding what is um, happening in your community. Um, by the way, as an aside, this is an area where you might start with federal maps, but absolutely not end with federal maps because the federal data are universally acknowledged to be highly problematic and, and broadly inaccurate. So they will be one data set to your planning, but 
on the ground knowledge of your community is the critical piece. And then you know what is served, what is unserved, how they are served, whether they are adequately served to many of the points that Bill made about upload speed, download speed, latency, mobility, ubiquity, et cetera. How are they meeting? How is this existing footprint, this, this set of um, technical uh, data that you have now developed, how does it align with what you determined in the previous step about requirements, goals, and priorities, and what you really care about, and where you want to really make measurable pro progress? And now, once you've looked at that, you understand something about what the gap is that you want to fill. In some communities, that gap will be, we just want to fill the places where there's not existing broadband at all. That might be 25.3. In other communities, the gap may be defined as anywhere where you can't get gigabit services. In other communities, the gap may be, may be defined as anywhere where you can't get competition. It's for the community to determine that, to determine what its priorities and goals are. That should absolutely not come from outside. But once you know that, you're then in a position to decide or to determine how are we going to fill that gap? And that's your next step, the design and cost estimates. What are we gonna build and what is it gonna take in capital and in operating cost to fill the gap that we defined in the previous steps? And once you have that information, capital and operating costs, the total cost of ownership for a selected technology, and you might compare multiple technologies to see which is most cost effective over time relative to its benefits. So for example, a fixed wireless solution may be less costly in capital costs up front, but over the course of 40 years, it may actually prove to be considerably more expensive than fiber to the premises. That is not at all unusual, by the way, when you work these numbers through. Um, so you'd analyze um, what it's going to take to fill that gap. And those numbers then, your capital and operating costs, are inputs to your financial model. Now we move on to that orange square, the financial model, which tells you, excuse me, which takes the inputs around cost and adds other data as necessary to these financial tasks, um, including potentially market and demand research, uh, where you do outreach again in a variety of different ways in order to understand what the, the demand is for the product that would be offered over the infrastructure that you, you designed in, in the previous steps. And the financial model will then, with all of those inputs, tell you a number of different things. What does your cash flow picture look like? How much money are you going to need on an annual basis? What do your risks potentially look like? What is your business going to be able to do? Um, and where might you have some risks and sensitivities that you should address now? Perhaps most importantly, it's going to tell you what you're going to need in terms of take rate, the number of customers who are willing to buy services from you in order to make the, the economics of your network work. And then you can go back to that market and demand research and compare it. So for example, <clears throat> if the financial model says that the, the network that you have selected or determined will meet your needs and your priorities will be able to pay for itself at a 35% take rate, you can then look to the market research to determine, given what we know of the market and demand and the ability of our community to pay and what it has told us about its willingness to pay, will we get a 35% take rate? In many community-oriented networks, 35% um, is eminently doable. In markets where there's no internet at all, or no, nothing resembling broadband internet, we sometimes see take rates closer to 60 and 70%. But in markets where there is already a provider, if the financial model tells you you need 70% to break even, you might see that as a major red flag. So you're going through a process of determining risk, opportunity, and, and what this might look like as you take on, if you go with a municipal model, as you take on something that will really look like a considerable amount of risk. At this stage, you might turn to another type of engagement process, as Bill said, reaching out to ISPs, 
where you're determining are there partners out there for you. So now we're back to engagement with the blue squares. And it may be that there is a partnership model that would allow you to mitigate or lessen or share or entirely offset the risk that you um, were able to quantify when you did the previous steps that resulted in a financial model that helps you to understand exactly what that risk looks like. And a partnership strategy, and I'll talk about these in, in another minute, but a partnership strategy could be a way of saying, we're going to share opportunity, we're going to share benefit, but we're also going to share risk. And maybe we'll do it through sharing assets, maybe we'll do it through sharing burden and effort over time, but we're not going to do this alone. And our partners might be public sector, they might be nonprofit, they might be for-profit private sector, but we are better off going down that road. That won't be the case for everyone, but it will for many people. And what that then leads to is um, a, a, an ability in partnership with your identified partners to build out relationships, to um, build tentative legal structure to your agreements that are dependent on certain kinds of financing and grant strategies that result in your business plan. So you understand where you fit into the broader picture with your partner or going it alone as a public entity. And that then leads to a bid in the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund or a grant application where now you understand exactly how participation in those programs will impact the economics of your plan through your financial model and the economics of your relationship with your partner. I am going on at too much length on this particular graphic, but I wanted to give you a sense of what we think a rigorous and robust process will look like. Um, I, um, I um, think I have only a couple more minutes before I'm going over time um, in what I've been allocated. So let me just share a couple more thoughts about rigorous process and, and what it could look like. This is another way of suggesting that you are able to, whether you're thinking about a network that goes all the way to the home or you're thinking about a middle mile effort, however it is that you are choosing to try to impact those priorities um, and address those challenges that you identified in the first step, um, that you can go through um, a, a process of engineering, financial, business, and market planning that um, builds on all of the, the previous steps in a way that is logical and gets you to a point that you have an actionable strategy and a clear understanding of the financial implications of that strategy so that um, you, you have answers for potentially elected officials or other entities, other policymakers and decision making um, positions, but also for um, um, you are sure that all of this aligns with the priorities and the principles you designed in, in the early stages of the project. One more quick thought around this and, um, and particularly the step about um, outreach to partners and building partnership strategies. I wanted to share a little bit more detail on this as with the financial modeling because these are such critical pieces to really having an actionable plan. As I said before, you can't just start with, oh, there's a grant opportunity, let's go for it and figure it out later. You also can't, unfortunately, just do the engineering and the cost estimation, because all that tells you is what it's gonna take you to build it and what it's gonna cost. It doesn't tell you how you're going to maintain it, operate it, sustain it, and make sure it benefits your community. So the, the as you think through the strategies and the options before you, I, I really recommend thinking quite broadly and going through a process where you evaluate a range of different options, including the kinds of public-private options that you'll hear about that have been developed um, you know, very innovatively in Urbana-Champaign, which was one of the first places where some of these models developed, and how these, um, that kind of public-private partnership can also serve to facilitate the goals. But the process, um, regardless of the model that you choose, whether it's public ownership on the left, um, community leasing capacity from a private entity, 
or some kind of a public-private partnership that's really focused on public assets and private execution, which is what the concessionaire and the dark fiber leasing model involve. Both all of these require um, this kind of um, rigorous process of data collection and analysis to get you to the point where <clears throat> through determining the model allocating risk and function and then testing the market to be sure that whatever the model requires in terms of take rate and community support is actually viable, um, that that is um, in place. Um, I, I'm not going to go into this because I think I'm using up more than my fair share of time, but um, there is a critical piece to looking at state and federal funding programs, which should and will be a necessary part of making all this work. And they will fit into your financial model as scenarios. Um, and th there are a wide range of options in the current moment, fortunately, that you can consider. Um, finally, um, there are lots of resources out there that I hope um, would be tools for helping you to go through this planning process and also just um, kind of uh, building a knowledge base to allow you to do so. Um, and I'll stop there with, uh, with thanks. Joanne, thank you so much. That was great. And you're right on time, so no problems. So That doesn't happen very often. I'm usually late. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up are Mike Smaltzer of UC2B and Brian Olson of ICE3 Broadband. Michael Smaltzer was principal instigator. I love that title. I've been accused of that a few times myself, but I think I need new business cards now. Uh, Michael's with the Urbana-Champaign Big Broadband Consortium, a $29 million broadband project connecting more than 250 community anchor institutions and passing almost 5,000 homes and businesses in 11 underserved neighborhoods. He's still active on the project as a board member. He has a very strong background in network technology and media. Brian Olson of I3 Broadband has been in the telecom business for 20 years and has been I3's general manager since 2009. I3 is the largest uh, fiber to the home provider in central Illinois, serving tens of thousands of businesses and residential customers. He lives in Peoria where I3 also provides competitive service. Welcome Mike, welcome Brian, thank you. Thank you Bill um, and thank you Joanne. Um, I, I should warn you folks that uh, this will be more of the caveman approach to doing this than what you've heard from Bill and Joanne, um, but it all adds up to the same place. And in fact, this is going to be a 14 minute summary of a 23 year effort. So hold on to your hats. Um, as Nancy's pointed out, the slides will be available later. And Brian is going to uh, follow me with uh, some discussion of what we've done together for the last six years and maybe what the future will hold. I've condensed what I think you need to know in the early stages of a broadband project into 13 questions. You may not know the answers today, but as you talk with others in your community, your answers will start to crystallize. The answers will probably evolve over time as you talk to more and more people. Our community fiber project actually started in 1997 with a different name. I called it CUNet 2000 then because I thought it would only take three years to get done. I was just a little overly optimistic. Uh, my original plan went no year for nowhere for 12 years. Then in 2009, when President Obama's ARRA stimulus bill included funding for broadband, I dusted off the old CUNet 2000 plan and got some professional help. That consultant's help was the difference between 12 years of no real progress and securing $26 million in federal and state grants. You've already been introduced to two good broadband consultants today. I urge you to talk with them and to others and to find out which one is a good fit for your community. If you don't know how you're gonna pay for a consultant, how are you gonna pay for broadband infrastructure? CUNet 2000 was way ahead of its time, but it established some concepts that were important for UC to be, which followed later, and may be important for you. CUNet 2000 envisioned three public and three private user groups sharing a fiber infrastructure. The public groups were government, public safety first responders, schools, and libraries. 
The private groups were medical facilities, financial institutions, and businesses. Servercom, the regional ISP that I worked with, was the primary sponsor for CUNet 2000. Skynet was also an early sponsor. Here are the questions, and I'm going to read them for the benefit of the folks who uh, are screen challenged. Who will be your evangelist? Who will be connected and receive services? Who will be your partners in this project? Who will design the network? Who will do the GIS mapping? Who will do the environmental assessment? Who will pay for construction? Who will do the construction? Who will manage the construction? Who will own the resulting infrastructure? Who will negotiate your dark fiber IRU agreements? Who will maintain the infrastructure? And who will operate and provide services over your new infrastructure? To answer that first question, get yourself a mirror. Unless you can find someone in your community who is more excited about broadband than you are, congratulations, you are your community's evangelist. Your local incumbent cable TV and telephone providers are not bad people, but they are probably not the answers to any of the rest of those questions. If they were, they would have already invested in better broadband in your community, and you would not be with us today. UC2B's answers, we somewhat made up as we were going along, but we formed, to start out with, we formed an intergovernmental consortium with the city of Urbana, the city of Champaign, and the University of Illinois, where I was the director of networking. We applied for and received $22.5 million for NTIA and $3.5 million from DCEO, which has some money currently. We also raised $3.4 million in matching funds. Our secret sauce for matching funds was pre-selling long-term dark fiber leases, called IRUs, to various organizations who wanted dedicated fiber strands for their own purposes. IRU is short for Indefeasible Rights of Use, a very complicated lease type agreement. Dark fiber IRUs are typically for 20 years and are paid up front. They also typically include annual payments for maintenance and jewelry locating. Indirectly or directly, all of the user groups that we envisioned in 1997 for CUNet 2000 ended up being served by UC to be dark fiber 15 years later. In September of 2011, we had a community groundbreaking ceremony in a local park that's adjacent to a library, a park district facility, a senior center, and a grade school. They were all slated to be connected to UC to be fiber. The homes in the background of this photo were also in one of the fiber to the premise service areas. We built seven fiber rings that each had 216 strands of fiber. That's enough total fiber strands to, sort fiber, to support fiber to the premise everywhere in Champaign-Urbana. We passed roughly 5,000 underserved homes and businesses with fiber to the premise, and we connected 256 very broadly defined community anchor institutions. Those broadly defined community anchor institutions were then second ingredient to our secret sauce. While we did include the usual suspects as community anchors, schools, both public, private, and religious, libraries, the University of Illinois and Parkland College, medical facilities, public safety facilities, public computing centers, local, county, and state government buildings and park district facilities. We also included many organizations that serve vulnerable populations, senior citizens and living facilities, Head Start centers, the Boys and Girls Club, homeless shelters, a crisis nursery, job training facilities, mental health group homes, a battered women's shelter, a developmental services center, an immigration services center, and churches and religious centers. The more anchor institution you include in your broadband, broadband project planning, the stronger your case is going to be for investment. So why fiber to the premise? If you're going to go to all the work to get your community connected and secure all the money it's going to take, invest in something that will last for generations. My youngest daughter is scheduled to have fiber installed in her home this summer. Her older sister kids, my grandkids, are in line to get fiber to their home in the next couple of years. I like buried fiber cables. In last week's webinar, Mark Latham from Highland talked about squirrels sometimes sharpening their teeth on aerial fiber cables. In my experience, in my experience that sometimes is every spring. Buried fiber cables can be damaged by errant backhoes, but there are far fewer backhoes than hungry squirrels in most communities. This is what UC2B's fiber rings look like on paper. 
Why build fiber rings? Well, many businesses and schools and public safety sites need dual redundant connections. A network built on rings allows for an errant backhoe or a hungry squirrel to damage a fiber cable without the ring sites losing connectivity. This is ring one, which is one of the CDB's busiest rings in Champaign. Give you an idea of how a wide variety of organizations can securely share a common fiber infrastructure. Some of these anchor institutions are connected by fiber strands that the city of Champaign leases. Some are connected by fiber strands that consolidated communications leases. Some of them are connected by fiber strands that the University of Illinois leases. Some of them are connected by I3 Broadband's fiber to the premise technology. Many of these connection locations have dual redundant connections, while most just have a single connection. This is what happens when you take those simple rings on paper and make them fit in the rights of way of your streets. The yellow shaded areas are the initial fiber of the premise areas where we built with our grant funding. You can see that the rings extend very far from those fiber of the premise areas in the middle of the map. People used to ask us why we were building fiber rings at the edge of the community and beyond. That becomes clear when through GIS mapping, you add in your anchor institution locations. Every one of those red squares is an anchor institution. Now that ring that goes all the way up in the north here, um, it makes sense why that's there because that's where St. Thomas More High School is. Now you can also see why we went so far south. That's where Willard Airport is and the FAA control tower as well as the fiber, fire and rescue team there are also connected. One of my favorite success stories is actually over in this part of the map, um, and that is Carl Medical Campus. What was once a huge cornfield in 2013 when we built the fiber rings is now a major medical campus. We knew in 2013 that the Carl Regional Medical System had future plans for a medical campus on this corner, so we located manholes and fiber where it could be easily easy accessed to facilitate that. When Carl's general contractor wanted internet and telephone communications at its on-site construction trailer, thanks to the existing uc to b fiber, that was easily and affordably accomplished in the middle of a cornfield. When the first medical building was still just a shell in the middle of that cornfield, and they were ready to activate the elevator phones and the fire alarm system, again, it was easily and affordably accomplished. In 2020, pre-COVID-19, there were 1,400 people who worked on this medical campus, and they were able to communicate with Carl doctors and record systems at all the other local Carl locations all over uc to b fiber In the quarantine world, many of those Carl employees now work from home, because Carl, and because Carl has great internet and intranet connectivity all, with all of its local fiber, all of its local facilities over uc to b fiber COVID-19 has highlighted the value of having all anchor institutions connected to broadband. Whether it's a small church that can now stream its Sunday services to sheltered at home parishioners, or a residential group home that can now facilitate Zoom sessions for its residents and mental health professionals. uc to b Fiber has made, helped make a bad situation a little bit better. COVID-19 has also highlighted the value of broadband to homes. UC to be initially passed 4,700 underserved households with fiber, and about 1,000 of them initially subscribed to UC to be service, which originally was only internet. Our long term goal was, and continues to be our long term goal, is to make fiber available to every household in Champaign Urbana. During the final years of our NTIA grant, when we had activated some customers but had not yet completed all the initial construction, the city of Champaign managed the internet service for our active customers. At the end of the grant, we sought a private company to provide services to those customers and to commit to expanding the fiber to the premise service areas. Neither Champaign nor Urbana have any direct city utilities. Unlike some of your com communities, in Champaign and Urbana, the cities do not provide water, natural gas, electricity, garbage collection, or sanitary sewers. It was not a good fit for either city to operate an ISP. So after some significant searching for the best possible partner, in 2014, we announced our partnership with ITV3, which was a fiber-based ISP from the Peoria area that was looking to expand. ITV3 was owned by the same family that owns the family video chain that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, they did expand the fiber to the premise service area somewhat, but in 2016, ITV3 was sold to a newly formed company from St. Louis called Countrywide Broadband. 
After that sale, almost all the employees stayed the same, and Countrywide, which now goes by I3 Broadband, has been far more aggressive in building additional fiber to the premise service areas, as well as building laterals out to more businesses. So from my perspective, that sale was a good overall upgrade. I3 has been a good partner. Here's the map that shows our fiber to the premise progress to date. The orange shaded areas were the original grant funded fiber to the premise areas. The areas shaded blue have been added by ITV3 or I3 broadband. The green lines show the rings and the, where the lateral fiber cables go from those rings. We are making progress on having fiber everywhere, but we still have a ways to go. I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Brian Olson, who is the general manager for I3 Broadband. He can give you his perspective on our public-private partnership, and perhaps now give you also a glimpse of the future. Over to you, Brian. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill, and to the entire team for, for uh, inviting me to join uh, in a long amount of time. And, and thank you to Joanne for, for describing, uh, describing the business that I'm in. Um, and, 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 Growing the network uh, uh, for the for the rest of you and for the rest of the, the state. Um, I think Mike did a, a great job of, of highlighting uh, the overwhelmingly positive relationship uh, that we have with Champaign Champaign Urbana and in our public private partnership of of growing that community. Um, but I'd be remiss to say that we don't that that we don't have an that we do have an overwhelmingly positive relationship with uh, over 30 more communities um, throughout the state of Illinois, uh, both small and large, uh, to small villages, to slightly larger cities and towns, and and even to the counties that that we serve. Uh, each one of them has their own individual pain points, uh, whether or not that be uh, the residents and the lack of competition higher prices, inferior services uh, to the businesses that, that, that need more redundancy, uh, also lower prices and more resilient services and next generation services. And whether or not that be to the, uh, to the city facilities and anchor institutions that, that Mike had described, each, each one of the communities that we serve and each one of the residents, the businesses or the uh, cities uh, has their own individual pay, pain points. Um, and what we found, uh, where, where I3 Broadband has found success, and I think where a lot of the private companies in, in the mid-sized network uh, space have found success is by working with the community. Um, it's, 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 it's often that when we first engage a new community, uh, that there's some fear and trepidation um, that we're just like the uh, the larger monopolies, and it, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, we're we're looking to solve some of the same pain points for the communities that we serve as the communities themselves are. Um, my statement is brief, and it's it's really that that you as the uh, evangelist, as as Mike called it, um, should really be seeking out uh, the help of the mid and small size service providers. I think what most people find is that they initially go to the larger carriers looking for help and they realize very quickly um, that, that they have a national plan and that they're not able to do certain things for the communities because it doesn't align with their national plan and it just, it's just a, a one-off of an assembly line. Um, companies like us are, are, are neither small and we're not large, but we're approachable and we're able to, to create uh, constructive solutions to each of the community's problems and, and pain points that they're able to, uh, uh, we're, that we're able to resolve with them. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much uh, uh, guys for that. Our final speakers are uh, Barry Adair, General Manager of Wabash Communications, and Joey Meyer, who is a uh, uh, village council member in Watson, Illinois. Barry has been with Wabash Communications in Louisville, Illinois since 2014, the last four years as General Manager. He also leads Illinois Fiber Connect, located in Louisville, and Flat Rock Telephone Cooperative. 
Barry has overseen the completion of a fiber to the home gigabit capable network overbuild and has driven aggressive corporate growth initiatives through both acquisition and strategic build out opportunities, including a joint venture with EJ Water Cooperative to provide broadband to rural Illinois communities. When you read the mission statement and service theme on the Wabash Co-op website, you can see that this is a type of provider that you would love to have in your community. Joey is a software engineer by day and serves as village board member in Watson. Joey played a key role in bringing fiber to the home connectivity to his community. Welcome, Barry and Joey. Thank you, Bill. Joey, are you on? I'm here. Thank okay. you. Great. Great. Are you going to run the slides, Nancy, or? Nancy, are you there? Yeah, I can get those slides. I Great. I was unaware that I was going to be doing that, but I will get those right now. <laughs> Sorry. Here, take a minute and describe kind of the area you serve. We are rural Illinois. Our traditional co-op is about 3,700 customers and our biggest village in the serving area is probably 1,200 people. Uh, the closest, I call it metro areas probably is uh, probably Marion Carbondale area, which is an hour and a half away, or East St. Louis, you know, the uh, Fairview Heights area, we're about an hour and a half away. In Champaign, Illinois, we're about an hour and 15 minutes south of Champaign. So we're out in the, we're the true definition of rural America, where we are. So. Great, your slides are up now, Barry. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, Wabash was founded in 1952. We've approximately got 11,000 customers now. Uh, the fiber to the home was completed in 2016. We have uh, three subsidiaries. We have Wabash Communications, which is our CLEC. And we have Montrose Mutual Telephone Company, a company we purchased. They're an ILAC. There are about 1,500 customers. And we have, Illinois, we have a joint venture with EJ Water Cooperative, which is Illinois Fiber Connect. And we are trying to keep up with the demand since this COVID-19 has hit. It's, it's probably doubled or tripled the demand for our people wanting broadband to their house or, or business. So it's, it's a uh, trying time, but it's a, it's a great opportunity for companies that are looking to expand if, if, you're, if you can in your area. And how we got started with this was uh, Joey contacted us about bringing fiber to Watson. And there was about, I'm guessing approximately close to 300 residences in the village of Watson and the, the outer areas. And Joey knew we were expanding and we, we had a fiber line going close to Watson, but we really went there. We had to plow about two to three miles to get to Watson from our main line. And then we started talking and, you know, we encourage people to go to our website and sign up and get interest going. And our board of directors has a payback model they want, and we've got to, got to stay close to that. And then we started working and we tried to, we had some town hall meetings. We had some, we was in the parade one, one Saturday trying to get, generate interest. We had some free, offered free meals for, to get, encourage people to sign up. And probably the biggest advocate was Joey. He was going around getting people to sign up on his personal level. He was the one that really pushed this. And when we said we'd get to 150 signups, we said we had come because typically when you get into a village, people get installed and then, they tell their neighbors, and then, as you can see, we're at 212 customers now in Watson after the original 150 sign-ups. So it's been a big success. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the state of the grant of the budget 
crisis in Illinois. A lot of uh, villages and cities do not have the funds available to try to get you coming. So, you know, villages like Watson, we have a lot of them, they just don't have the funds. So we had to basically, that's our joint partnership. The village bought in with it, trying to help us, you know, get people signed up, promote it in the city, send it in their water bills. And we finally got to where we could get in there to get, get construction going. I don't know, if, Joy, you want to add anything to that? I mean, hear your side of it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so like Barry said, we worked with Wabash uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we heard they were expanding. Um, I reached out, uh, started working with Dave Friggin. Um, he came in, he brought a couple people with him to one of our village hall meetings, kind of discussed with the board what uh, kind of expectations that Wabash had. Um, uh, we ran with that and we started doing some door-to-door -door soliciting um, for the service. Um, and from there, I mean, we, it, uh, there was some obvious interest due to some um, conflicts with our only provider in the area. And, um, you know, everybody started signing up and um, not everybody in our community is tech savvy, but they all have a reason to use the internet. So uh, sometimes we would have to go over to their house and sit down with them. But what's awesome about the village board being involved there is we know a lot of these individuals personally. We, you know, I, I grew up in Watson. Um, you know, it, it was definitely underserved as far as internet goes. There was several local providers who tried to provide better services and I commend them for their efforts, but you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't what we needed in the, in today, you know, in a modern internet era, um, the streaming services and uh, gaming platforms and just all the different use cases for the internet today is just, it, you have to have something a little bit more stable. Um, but like I said, we worked with Wabash Communications all the way through all this, and they were awesome giving us some marketing literature, um, helping us ensure that people got registered. Um, you know, I thought it was a great uh, joint venture, and I can't take all the credit, you know. Um, I have a great board behind me as well who also contributed going door to door and and helping set up you know the free meal at the restaurant in in Watson it's actually our only restaurant and and it's <laughs> recent so it was great to see them work with us to provide that meal to ensure that we got uh, Wabash Communications to move in and uh, provide us internet um, it was great that they also showed a present in our village parade uh, that was something that we didn't expect but it, it was awesome that you know when we reached out that they were able to do that um i see a question but um yeah it was a, it was great joint effort um and you know it took a few door to doors it took the the meal um but we got there we got all the signatures we needed and i think that really came from us knowing everybody in the area and being able to trust a co-op like Wabash Communications. And in regards to that question, uh, yeah, back then we did have a contract. It was like a, you, you didn't have to sign it. It was whether it was have, back then we was charging $150 install fee. If you wanted it waived, you sign a one year contract. So, but here we've, we've now started waiving the install fee and the agreement. We call them agreements. We don't call them contracts. So we, we just waive the agree, agreement because basically when we get somebody hooked up on fiber, probably 90, 95% of them stay with us. The only reason they leave is if they move or you know they can't pay their bill. We hardly lose a customer due to service on fiber. I'm sure it happened, but I, I can't think of one to this date. Thank you for, so much for that. That's a, a, a great perspective on how things can work in smaller communities. Barry, do you try and serve the rural areas surrounding Watson then as well? We ventured out a little. I mean, we have a payback model and we try to stay within that model. Uh, 
but we, you know, if the house is two miles away, it's probably not going to work. I mean, unless the customer wants to pay an upfront aid to construction fee. Now, if we go to cell tires, you know, sometimes they're out in the rural areas and we will try to pick up customers along that cell tire route. Okay. And Are you seeing uh, interest by the, like the county officials to try and address those issues? Yes, but the problem is, is the matching funds. I mean, when you, when you talk about rural counties, it may cost you ten, fifteen thousand dollars a house, and you have to have a grant mechanism or some kind of matching funds to do that if you want to do the whole county. I know there's some grants out there. We've applied for RUS Reconnect, and we are doing the rural areas. We got one grant in Jefferson County and Wayne County, and that was a big one. That's you know that's that's serving basically rural areas. Most of that is okay. Interesting. Well, in Minnesota, some of our group uh, that works on rural broadband, we say that everybody needs a Kippy because Kippy is a community leader uh, without a title up in far northern Minnesota. And he went, he did the door to door activity yep. over a 30 square mile area to, uh, and as a result, the community received a big reconnect grant, the 75% grant to. Yep. Uh, provide services in their area. So I guess in Illinois, we're going to say that everyone needs a Joey now. Exactly. Everybody needs a Joey and they need a local provider. It seems like if uh, if you have a local telco, I would reach out to them because like us, you, you don't have to have consultants telling you whether it's going to work or not. We can tell you without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the consultants and engineering estimates and you don't have to wait a couple of years to get it done. You know, like the deal with Watson, you know, Joey came to us and we run the model and we told him what we had to have and it worked. I mean, Joey and his board and the community got out and beat the bushes and got the signups. I mean, that's a classic example of a, a, a joint partnership. So even though there was no money involved from the community, it was just time and effort and collaboration with us. We have, uh, um, oh, thank you. So the, uh, Joanne, do you want to talk a little bit uh, uh, about some of these funding opportunities now that you see, you know, the RDOF program is coming up and uh, that's going to be so important for rural areas? Um, yep, yeah, I'm happy to do so. I'm uh, just going to search for um, my deck and see if I can pull it back up. Um, and uh, if not, then, um, well, I may not be able to share it. I, I will look for it while we, um, while we are talking. Um, the, the, the range of options before you all, whether through public-private partnerships or for purely public um, opportunities, um, include um, a number of different types of funding streams. That one of the ways that the federal government gives out funding is through grant programs. And there are a number of them that are currently active. There are a number that we expect will be active in the future where there hasn't been an appropriation for next year yet, but I'd be very surprised if there's not, such as the USDA Reconnect program, which has bipartisan support and has, you know, by all accounts, been an extremely successful and well-regarded program. Um, there are also grant programs that are currently open um, under the CARES Act, uh, which is um, the, the last big stimulus bill that was passed by Congress. I, I can't even really call it a stimulus bill because it's, um, it's more of a stabilization bill um, that is um, seeking um, to um, manage the current economic frankly, not just crisis, but collapse that we are undertaking. And I found my slide, so I'm going to pull it up now. Um, the, the thing to note um, about these programs is that they're very time specific. They're run by different agencies um, and um, they are, um, they have different requirements and different obligations. Uh, the one that you should know about that is open right now and that is available to all communities throughout the country is one run by the US Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration or EDA. 
and EDA got $1.5 billion under the Recovery Act and is funding both planning and infrastructure projects that will are demonstrated to have job creation impact. So not job creation just through construction, but job creation where if they invest in a particular initiative, companies will benefit and will create new jobs in that community. This is not a grant opportunity that is open to for-profit entities. It's public and nonprofit only, but you certainly can have a partnership with a private entity that will benefit from the grant indirectly by having new economic opportunity, including by creating jobs. That's one that you should know about. And as Mike Smeltzer knows, I've been promising to send out a briefing on this for a week and I, I actually will send it out today. So if anyone wants it, please let me know. That's an opportunity open now. They ex are accepting um, applications now. It's first come first serve money. So I jump on it if you have a project in mind. Um, uh, and uh, I would anticipate that uh, they will probably run out of funds within a few months at most. Julian, we had a question in program? the chat box. Would you, yeah, would you mind repeating the name? Oh, sure, I'm sorry. It, it's um, uh, the uh, US Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration. It's, um, uh, the program is called um, their Public Works Program. It's an existing program that Congress added an extra 1.5 billion to under the CARES Act. Um, and I'll, I'll put it in the chat after the question, um, and I'll also circulate more information through Nancy if that is helpful. I uh, definitely one to jump on now. It's very promising. It's not going to fund enormous grants. It'll be in the few millions at most, and it's going to be very competitive for those grants, but um, you can uh, do an enormous amount in your community by, for example, building fiber to an office park um, or to an area that is chronically underserved in order to allow small businesses to thrive. There's, there's a lot of opportunity under that program. The other big item that is out there right now that you should all know about is the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund. This is the uh, big reverse auction that the FCC is going to conduct beginning on October 29th. And this is $16 billion of funding, which is, even by FCC standards, is a lot of money. And this is money that will be reverse auctioned on a competitive basis. Any entity that meets the financial qualifications is eligible to bid. And the, the funds will be given out over 10 years to the winning bidders. And a reverse auction means effectively to the low bidders, although there's more detail around that. You get prioritized if you are building fiber and have a high speed, low latency product. But it, it's a low bid type process. And it is only for census blocks that the FCC considers to be unserved with broadband, which as we all know, is an imperfect measure because the FCC's data is notoriously bad, but it is a pretty good starting point if you've got a business plan and a strategy or a partner that you are trying to encourage to expand, this is a funding opportunity that should at least be evaluated um, pretty robustly. The, the two um, uh, deadlines that you should know about are uh, July 15th, it's either the 15th or the 16th, which is when the, the document known as the short form will be due to the FCC. What the short form is, is, the, is it is the mechanism by which the FCC establishes that you are eligible to bid, where you tell them you've got financial viability, you're an operating entity, you're not fly by night, et cetera. You tell them what technology or what speed and latency you will be offering. And then they effectively qualify you to participate in the auction. Filing the short form does not obligate you to do anything. You will still have time between then and October 29th to do more in-depth planning, but you may want to consider looking at this program and looking at the short form um, just as a way of keeping your options open should you want to um, bid in it. And for many of the communities who are on the line for this webinar, you may not want to do this and you may not feel like you will be ready by October to do that, to do this. That is entirely reasonable, but what you might want to think about doing is outreach to your potential private partners to encourage them to do so. And if they are not already planning to do so, what you really need to know is 
What can you do? What can the state of Illinois do? What can your local partners do to encourage the private sector to bid in this auction and, and ideally to bid based on high speed, low latency technologies that will benefit your community? The same is true for the other grant opportunities. They may not be grants in all cases that you as a community want to go after, but it may be something where you want to support a private partner to access these grants. Some of the grant opportunities, particularly coming out of USDA, are extraordinarily burdensome to apply for, incredibly time consuming, really rigorous, unnecessarily difficult, I would say. And for many small providers, it's just not worth the time. But where a community steps in, and I see this all the time, a community will step in and say, let us bear 80% of the effort to fill out the grant application, to collect the data, to get the letters of support, et cetera. You'll get the benefit of it we'll get the benefit of broadband in our community, but let us just make it less burdensome for you to participate. So that's another way that I would recommend that many of you on the line who are communities think about the grant programs, not necessarily as your grant opportunity, but as your partners. I'll stop there. Thank you, Thank Joanne. You, Barry, uh, is that grant with EDA, is that 100%, 75% or? Yeah, Barry, that's an excellent question. It's 80%, they're requiring 20% match. They have, Ordinarily, they require a 50% match. So this is a massive concession to the current crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they have said that they will go down to 0% match in very unique circumstances. For example, um, on Native American lands. Um, and they may under other circumstances where there's enormous economic need, but like the applications will be more competitive if they have a 20% match. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to turn it over to Zachary to facilitate the rest of the questions. Thanks so much to our speakers. Excellent. Yeah, I'd echo Bill's sentiment. Thank you so much. Um, there's just a couple questions that didn't get answered directly um, during the, the speaker's time. So the first is, and Mike kind of touched about on this about with the UC2B um, story, but are there standard partnership models that would include colleges and universities as you're looking at um, doing community broadband development? Joanne, do you want to try a shot at that? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, there's, there's no standard set of models. There, there are a number of different ones. I think the UC2B story is a really good illustration of just how um, potent it is that when a university is partnered with its local community or communities, it is a force multiplier for a variety of different reasons, including that most universities have considerable internal communications and IT capabilities, and many cities do as well. But when you aggregate all of that, there's a lot of expertise that is brought to the table. Universities are also sometimes able to accept and administer grants um, more easily than, um, than cities and counties. I, but I, as far as the models go, I would think of universities as filling that role, as in the case of uc to b of providing expertise and support and sometimes seed capital. I would also think of universities as key stakeholders because for a university in a great university town like Urbana or Champaign, having fiber to the home for staff, faculty, and students is a massive advantage that everything from recruiting faculty to want to come um, live there and making sure that their families feel they've got adequate internet to making it possible for students coming off campus where they've had the best internet in the world to now stay in town because they've got great internet instead of having to move to Silicon Valley in order to participate, for example, in our technology economy. And then I would think of universities also as big buyers of bandwidth. And so they are anchor tenants sometimes to a network, whether public or private. Um, they fill other roles as well, but those are um, among the, the most prominent. Joanne, this is Mike. Uh, in the interest of time, um, way back when, when the intergovernmental consortium between the two cities and the university was created, they basically took an existing intergovernmental consortium agreement, scratched out the name of that and put in UC to B and just ran with it. Um, you know, it's, it's likely that your county or your city already has some intergovernmental agreements with your local university or your local junior college. Um, it didn't have to be anything special. In, in, it, those, those existing agreements already deal with governance and funding and so forth. 
uh, and that worked out fairly well for us. And I think the key part of that is, uh, and Mike's slide showed this very well, is that the a uh, lot of people have fiber assets. And uh, when you can connect those assets to each other, then suddenly you have a network. And, uh, and that is a real possibility with the university or hospital systems and so on. Um, and so of course, a lot of times those purchase agreements or the way they own their network, they might not own it as much as they think they do as they're leasing parts of that from various providers who are pretty savvy when they write their agreements. So, but that is all worth exploring about those anchor tenants is what part they can play in a network deployment. Zachary, what else do we have? Sure, so um, during uh, Barry and Joey's comments, we had a question uh, regarding advice, I guess they're seeking for areas that are not already, rural areas that are not already covered by a rural telephone co-op. Um, any suggestions on how they might proceed? You might could find a uh independent telecom around you in, you know, a telco or you may just have to go. I mean, I know it's going to, I know Frontier is in bankruptcy right now. I don't know what, you know, what, what luck you would have with that one, but you just try to find the closest one to you. I mean, and it, they may be hundreds of miles away. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure that's going to happen in some cases. So, so uh, you have a, tele, a co-op telephone association, don't you? Yes. You have NTCA and the National Telephone Communications Association, and you could reach out to them. They could help you try to connect you with somebody, or if it's in here in Illinois, I can help you reach out to some people if we're not close by. So Yeah, and I would look for their events when you see the uh, Illinois Telephone Association or the, if you have a cooperative association yep. uh, organizations when they have an event, go there and, and uh, uh, chat and because there's a lot of different, uh, in Minnesota especially, there's many uh, different collaborations and consortiums of telecom providers that they may be some distance away, but they may have a network that runs, you know, long haul fiber past your area. Correct. So, um, and there- That's another possibility, Bill. You could reach out and I know you could pop out of a handhold and try to get a you know, a 10 gig connection or whatever you need to serve a town. If, if it's hundreds of miles away, if there's somebody close by, you could do that. That is very good. Good point. One of the things that we're seeing is that uh, the rush to get more scale as a telecom provider, that we see the co-ops uh, that are expanding so that they can spread their overhead over larger numbers of customers for billing systems and marketing and all those things. So, uh, I think there is a fair amount of appetite amongst a, a good number of telephone cooperatives to get bigger and to provide services over a bigger area. But as they, one of their restraints is their balance sheets, they may not have that cash. And so how do you assist them? One of the things about the big companies is that they want their money back in two or three years that they invest to make their business case. A co-op might be eight, nine, ten years to think, okay, we're going to be more patient in the recovery of that. But if you can somehow use public bonding uh, and to build a network and then lease that to a telephone cooperative, that can be a great model that allows the company to expand without uh, getting in the way of uh, uh, their borrowing agreements with uh, USDA or CoBank. And, uh, uh, so that that's a real strategy that is low risk to the community, but high benefit. Excellent. Um, so we had a question in rural Illinois markets. What are the core use cases that consumers and businesses are sharing as their need for fiber link broadband versus other broadband connectivity options? So you see in the education space or online commerce, entertainment. What are some of those use cases that folks are sharing? Ryan, do you want to take a shot at that? Oh, you're muted. Uh, apologies. I, I think the use case is the same whether or not the, uh, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Um, yes. I, I think the use case isn't about whether or not somebody's more urban or rural. I think, I think in today's economy, uh, worldwide economy, the use case is the same 
across the footprint. I think you'll see and hear more people talk about uh, smart agriculture and, and things of that nature, but, but generally the, the schools, the businesses that are rural, the residents, uh, uh, the pain points regarding broadband are the same no matter where you live. And does that uh, hold true for uh, comparing different technologies? Because I believe their question was specifically asking about fiber link broadband versus other sort of broadband connectivity options. Um, do you see any difference in use case or is it still broadband access to broadband access? I, I think ha having, ha the, the, I, I suppose the answer to the question is whether or not their broadband should be on par with that of someone in a, in a more urban area. Um, and I think the answer is yes, uh, in, unless we keep all of those technologies on par and moving forward you know, in, throughout each generation of technology, uh, anyone left behind is, is perpetually going to be behind in that technology. And I think in, increasingly so. And I think with fiber, the things that drive the uh, desirability of fiber optics are certainly the uh, upload speed capability. We say that the download speed is consumption and upload speed is productivity or economic development. And so more and more we see farmers and firms from all parts of the sec, uh, economic, through the economy, the upload speed is more and more important as people become creators of videos and large data files and backing things up to the cloud and disaster recovery kind of plans. And then the other piece is the low latency that fiber networks can provide uh, that uh, enable a uh, wide range of interactivity um, uh, to happen in a you know, seamless fashion. Excellent. Well, that covered pretty much all the questions that weren't already addressed um, that were in the chat space. Um, does anybody else have any additional questions real quick that they want to put in the chat space? If not, they can be thinking about that. We'll put up a poll question. Um, and we're, it's basically going to ask you about your, your learning for today. And you can click right on the screen to answer. Um, we appreciate that feedback, and I know our speakers do as well. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to join us next Wednesday, May 27th at 1130 AM Central Time for part three of this series, uh, which will be Broadband 101 and cover various broadband technologies, highlighting the strengths and weaknesses of each. Uh, we really thank you for, for, uh, excuse me, for participating in today's webinar, and we hope to see you next week. Um, and until then, take care and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. And again, we will send the um, slides uh, to all the registrants afterwards so that you have those.